I decided to uh, name this presentation uh, Rethinking Democracy, Steps to Political and Social and Environmental uh, Justice. Uh, as was said at, at, the, at the beginning part of the analysis, uh, I am going to uh, present uh, uh, today in like uh, 15 minutes. Uh, is based on my book, uh, The Price of Democracy, that has uh, just been translated, and I'm very proud uh, uh, about that in, uh, in Spanish, uh, El Precio de, de, de la Democracia. Uh, the, 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 the departure point uh, for this work uh, is, the, is the following. Uh, I, I think we will all agree uh, that uh, today there is a crisis of, uh, of democracies and there is a crisis of representation. And I, I think that this crisis of representation is linked uh, to the capture of the democratic game uh, by private money. Uh, first of all, it is important to uh, keep it in, in mind uh, the fact uh, that democracy has a cost, uh, which is not a bad uh, thing per se. Uh, democracy has a cost uh, because uh, running for elections, uh, running electoral campaign, uh, involved the campaign expenditures, uh, which is not bad per se. Again, I think it's good that candidates can inform citizens uh, about their programs, for example. And the, the second cost of democracy uh, is linked to the funding of political parties. Uh, the, 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 the big issue is not the one of the cost of uh, democracy. The big issue uh, is the one of who is going to pay for this cost. Uh, and the fact is that if the cost of democracy is not funded equally by all the citizens through public funding, then it will be captured by private interest. And when democracy is captured by private interest, then we can no longer define democracy as one person, one vote, but democracy is defined as uh, one dollar, one vote, which is something much closer to uh, autocracy in a sense. Uh, the thing is, uh, I'm going to show you evidence from the US, I'm going to show you evidence from France, from a number of different countries. I would love to also have uh, evidence uh, uh, using data from uh, Chile. The thing is, uh, if you look at all these countries, donations to politics, donations to campaigns, donations to political parties are strongly associated uh, with, uh, uh, with social class positions. The, 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 the first evidence comes from the, from the US. Just to give you a sense, if you look at the US, you see that the top 0.01% of the population uh, is uh, having a share of the total income that is around 4 or 5%. So there is a lot of economic inequality, uh, but there is even more inequality in terms of like political inequality because these very rich persons are representing uh, around 14% of all campaign contributions. Uh, if you look at uh, France, uh, where I uh, collected a lot of uh, fiscal data, you have exactly the same big, big picture. You know, if you look at the majority of the population, here you have all the population ranked depending on the income. So if you look at the, uh, at the, uh, at the left, uh, you have uh, people with like low income, then you have like uh, all the income, and at the top you have people that are in the top 0.01% of the income distribution. And you see that the higher the income of the individuals, the higher the probability uh, to contribute to political parties and the higher the amount of the donations they make uh, to political parties. This is the case uh, in the US, this is the case in France. You know, I'm not going to comment on all these uh, figures one after the other, because I, I, what I want to, to, to do with you uh, for this Congress of Futuro is more to uh, insist on what can be done, but you know you have exactly the same kind of plot like that for the UK or for Germany as well than for a number of other uh, Western democracies. This is the first thing. Uh, so uh, democracy, if you look at the way it is funded today, is not funding according to what should be the democratic rule, one person, one vote. Uh, it, it is uh, mostly funded by uh, people who are at the top of uh, the income distribution, first thing. Uh, the second thing, uh, this creates an, an equal access to political donations that is harmful for democracy. Uh, the fact that uh, rich people tend to contribute more uh, to uh, the funding of democracies is also associated to the fact that on average, right-wing political parties, so pro-business political parties, tend to receive much more money, much more donations than left-wing political parties. Uh, this has two consequences. 
First of all, in a lot of countries, uh, this helps uh, right-wing uh, political candidates uh, winning the election. So this has a direct uh, impact on who is going to be elected. And the second big, big issue is that this has led traditional left-wing parties, and this is, for example, the case of the Democrats in the US, to shift to pro-business positions and to abandon uh, the ideas of uh, uh, progressive fiscality, uh, redistribution, fight against uh, inequality. So this is not just about, okay, who is going to pay for the democratic game. This is about the, 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 the consequences, direct consequences this had uh, for, the, uh, for the, 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 our life as, uh, as citizens. And the second uh, important thing that uh, not only uh, the fact is uh, that, uh, that the rich tend to contribute more uh, to politics, uh, and that it has uh, consequences uh, for uh, the kind of uh, uh, politics that are implemented by uh, elected politicians. But the thing is that in a number of countries, because at the end of the day, when you contribute to a political party or when you contribute to a non-profit organization, you can uh, benefit from tax deduction. We have a system in which uh, the poorest pay to satisfy the political preferences of the rich which is what you see, for example, on this plot, where you see that the French government uh, on an annual basis is spending much more money uh, to fund the political preferences of the rich than to fund the political preferences of, uh, of the poor. Okay? This is the case in countries uh, like France, Germany, Spain, Italy, uh, when you have tax deductions associated to political donations. But this is also the case in countries such as the UK, of the US, when you, where you do not have tax deductions for political donations, but you do have tax deductions for what is uh, called philanthropy, uh, but uh, which is very often used uh, by people who have enough resources uh, as a way uh, to buy political influence. Last point I want to uh, alight, and if you go online, you just like Google uh, priceofdemocracy.com, uh, you, you go on the website for the book, and on the website for the book, uh, you will find a lot of evidence from France, a lot of evidence from the UK on the relationship uh, between uh, campaign finance and in particular candidates' campaign expenditures and the probability of the candidates uh, to win the election. And what you will find is that on average, everything is equal. The more the candidates spend on electoral campaigns, the higher its probability to uh, to win the election. So money has a direct impact on uh, the uh, uh, results of, uh, of the election. Okay. What are the consequences of uh, these uh, couple of facts? Uh, they are the following. They are the fact that politicians tend to take into account the preferences of the most affluent. Okay. And they do not take into account the preferences of the majority of the citizen, which create a huge crisis of representation. So what can we do? And this is uh, what I really want to alight uh, because I, I know that you are thinking about the future. You are thinking about what should be included in, in new constitution. And I, and I think that the, the first thing that uh, should be included in the new constitution is a way to define political equality. And political equality also comes through an equal funding of democracy. So the first thing that I propose is first to drastically limit private donations. Okay, I think that, for example, we should not allow an individual to give more than 200 euros per year to a political party or to a political campaign. And corporations should not be allowed to contribute uh, to political parties or campaign. But given this was my departure point, given that democracy has a cost, we need to find a way to have an equal public funding of democracy, which is what I call the democratic equality vouchers. So what I do propose is to introduce a system in which each year, each citizen can choose to allocate an equal amount that is like given by the state to the political movement of his or her uh, choice. Okay. And these are three goals, equality, one person, one dollar, one vote, renewal, because this is a way to have annual funding of political movements. And if you have the apparition of new political movements, they would benefit from uh, this annual funding and also stability. The second thing is that we, we, we suffer exactly from the same issue today as think regarding the direct funding of democracy. 
and the funding of uh, the non-profit uh, the non-profit sectors. So I do think that beyond politics, we should introduce a voucher program for the funding of the non-profit uh, on the on the non-profit sectors. And I think it will lead, and this is very important, in particular with respect to all the conversation you had. Uh, during the past uh, few days uh, linked, for example, to the issues uh, linked to climate change. I think this will benefit new non-profit organizations, in particular non-profit organizations fighting for climate, given that young people uh, will contribute much more than uh, what they are doing as of today. Okay. The third thing, and for me, you know, this is an idea I was pushing since uh, 2014, 2015, and for me, when I thought what was uh, happening in Chile, you know, it was kind of a revelation that, okay, this can be done in a concrete way. I think we should introduce rules to make sure that the national assemblies of parliament will look like the rest of the society. So this is what I call the mixed assembly. And I think this mixed assembly should guarantee parity from a sexual point of view. So we have, you know, half of the population is made of women, half of men. So we need to have half of the uh, MPs that are men and half women, but also from a social point of view. I think one of the big issues today, you know, here I, I, I put some number for the UK, some number for France. We can have like numbers that are similar, unfortunately, for a number of other countries. Unfortunately, as of today, if you look at blue collar workers, they are underrepresented in all, uh, the, 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 in all the democracies. Uh, in, in the country like France, as of today, you have less than 3% of blue collar workers among the MPs, while blue collar workers is still represent 50% of the population. So we should introduce a number of rules. And I think this should be done constitutionally so that to guarantee parity in terms of gender and parity uh, in terms of, uh, uh, like what I call social parity in terms of uh, social and economic background. Okay, and the last thing uh, to conclude, and not to be uh, out of time, I want to insist on uh, is the media sector, is information. When I say democracy is one person, one vote, in fact, what I should say is that democracy is one informed person, one vote. The reason why democracy works is when people get enough information when they go and vote uh, to really pick the candidate they want to pick and the candidate that is going to implement policies that correspond to their own preferences. The big problem we have now, from this, I, I do know a little bit uh, what is happening uh, in Chile in terms of media industry. The big issue we have now in Chile and in all Western democracies and in a number of other democracies in Latin America is that the media sectors is captured by uh, a small number of billionaires. So there is not enough competition in the media industry first. And second, the media industry is used by a number of billionaires to satisfy their political preferences and to push their media agenda. I think the idea of pluralism for the media and second, the idea of media independence should be considered as constitutional uh, principles. And so what I would like to propose to conclude is what I call an information democratization law, where I think there are six points that are of importance to guarantee pluralism and to guarantee journalist independence. The first one is a shared governance of the media. And we should have media with boards, including half of employees representative. The second thing is that I think that the appointment of the managing director should be made by the Democratic Board and should be made with the assent of 16% of the journalists, because the journalists are the, the best person to protect journalism independence. Third, I think we should give a right of approval an approval agreement to the journalist in case of a change in ownership. We should also guarantee transparency 
of media ownership, and I think this is key if we want to rebuild confidence into the media industry. I do think that we cannot have information of quality without journalists. And so I want to introduce an obligation for the media to employ a minimum proportion of journalists that should be defined as a share of the media total revenues. And last but not least, because I believe that information is a public good, I think it should have at least a non-profit dimension, which is why I defend the idea of the obligation for the media to set aside a proportion of their annual profits to be sure that there will be this non-profit dimension to, uh, to the media industry. Last but not least, media are a public good. If you want to fund public good, this is like for the political game, you need to have public money. The big issue, if you look at the history, for example, what happened recently again in Latin America, in Argentina, is the fact that the public funding of the media can be used by government uh, as a tool to manipulate uh, information content. What can you do to avoid that? We should have public funding of the media that is allocated not by the government, but that is allocated by the citizens that themselves. And this is why, for the same reason why I propose democratic equality voters, I think for the, the funding of the media, we should introduce media vouchers. And so I propose to give each other a media voucher worth 15 euros each year to donate to the media outlets of his or her choice. Because I do think that first we need to reach political equality, but it won't be possible to do so without a re radical democratization of the media industry. So again, you know, I, I try to do it in 15 minutes, <laughs> which is an easy uh, because these are complicated topic, but I am glad to that you gave me uh, this uh, opportunity to uh, give a few words uh, during this uh, uh, event. So uh, again, like, uh, uh, muchas gracias para, para uh, esta invitación.